glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. It's a free gift for us, but it costs him a great deal. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times have reached their fulfillment. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. Say marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Can I get an amen? Alexander encouraged us to learn that portion of scripture, to get to grips with the the sevenfold blessing of Christ. I want to say that that portion of scripture has revolutionized my prayer life. It's taken me about a year to get to know it relatively well because I just am a slow learner like that. But I would really encourage you to get super deeply dived into this because when you let this text wash over you and it becomes a part of you that you can't help but be thinking these things when the pauper hits the fan or when the enemy comes at you with lies, you say, no, 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 no. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. God's given me the wisdom that I need. I'm blameless. Devil, you, you, you might be wanting to hold up a mirror to let me see how, how yuck my week has been and how yuck I've been in the week that's gone past. But actually, God sees me as holy and blameless. Why? Because I'm in Christ. Do you know that God wants it to be so drummed into our minds that when Paul wrote this, from verse 3 to verse 14, he mentions in Christ, through Jesus Christ, in him or by him. It's like mentioned 11 times. It's almost once every verse. Because it doesn't start or begin with me. It's in him and through him. In him and through him. I bring nothing to the table except my life such as I am. And I just say, Lord, this is who... Lord, and literally my prayer life sometimes feels like I'm stumbling over my words. I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, but I thank you for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you for these because it sets you up for victory. Even when everything around you feels like it's going to hell which it may very well be. I don't presume to stand here and say that life is easy for anybody. Yeah, I know that it's not. But you see, what it says here at the end of verse 14, we've been marked with the Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Okay? He's the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the uh, the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory, which is the ultimate goal. God's glory. Okay, but we get these things in us so that what comes out of us is led by the Spirit so that God would get the glory. And what I really want to go after are a couple things. You know, verse 9 and 10, it says, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And then if you drop down to verse 22 and 23, 
right at the bottom it says, and God placed all things, there's that word again, under his feet, right? And appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in, any, in every way. Under Jesus' feet is under our feet. Now, I know I'm starting to tread into the realm of authority here that we have in Christ. We wanted to camp around identity, but I'm just wanting to leave that hanging with you, okay, for what's coming down the line in this series. Under his feet is under your feet, off the back of everything that I've just been reading from verse 3 to verse 14, because it's in Christ. It's by Jesus Christ. It's through Christ. It's because we're holy and blameless in his sight. So learn those things. I, want to, I don't want to hang around too much on this, but, but learn those things. Get to grips with them. The, someone did a wonderful little uh, um, kind of uh, graphic, I think, last week. You know, take a screenshot. Keep that on your phone. Make it your whatever. Jeez, I can't think of those words right now. Yeah, that one. That's that thing. Screensaver, yes. Do we even have screensavers anymore? Anyway, we're too busy on our devices. The screensaver doesn't kick in. Um, let me ask you this question. Who's the hero of the story here? It's Christ, right? It's Jesus. If the mystery of God's will, as verse 9 and 10 says, if the mystery of God's will is to bring unity to all things under Christ, is it fair to say that there's a corporate identity being woven into our story as well? Unity, that word unity is key for us to understand and to get to grips with. Because it's not just about Greg going off on a tangent and running, oh no, God's told me this, so I'm just going to go like a, a maverick. You know, we all love Top Gun Maverick and we, we cheer it on, you know, Hollywood style guys with whatever, carrying on like heroes. But actually Jesus is the hero. And if I separate myself from the body, I've got a problem. I've got a problem, friends. So yes, there's stuff that God is wanting to do in us and through us, and it's for the benefit of everybody here. But in that same breath, I want to say everybody here, it's, you are here for the benefit of everybody here. It's not just to warm a seat on a chilly winter's chilly winter's morning. It's that's just not what it is. If all that you've coming coming to church for is to get a little checkbox ticked, friends, it breaks my heart to think that that is all you think that Christianity is about. If that is anybody sitting here, because Christianity starts. This is literally just like halftime oranges in the game. It's like the pep talk for what's to come Monday to, set to, to next Sunday. Because you are holy and blameless, therefore you can speak with authority into the situations that you face. And it is a done deal, accomplished 2,000 and some change years ago. There is nothing that you and I ever brought to the table that made God decide that he was going to do this for us. Are you guys with me? That is who we are. Adopted before the creation of the world. Sons and daughters of the Most High. It speaks about Jesus being the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It means that when, when everything was getting created and, and the fall had not yet happened, God already had the, the plan in place. He had decided within himself that this is what he was going to do. And this is how he was going to relate to you and I. And should we blow it, there was still a, the, the, the opportunity, well, there was still the, um, for lack of a better word, contingency to keep, to get us back into the fold with him and to, to live what he had created us to live. In Christ, are you with me? Jesus had purposed this in his heart from before time began. He knew. That is who you and I are. That is how special you are to him. Okay? Sure, it's, a, it's very hush here. It makes me nervous. I hope it's okay, guys. I hope this is all right. A healthy me equates to a healthy we. 
You may have heard Ryan and other leaders perhaps say that. A healthy me equals a healthy we. Which is why I'm wanting to go after the corporate thing so, so much this morning. Because it's very important that you understand what God has done for you personally, but it's also very important because off the back of that determines very, um, uh, well, really seriously how you relate to one another, how we relate to one another. Because if I'm coming with the junk and the baggage of a past that is, it is what it is. I've sinned. Even in this year, of course, even in this, even in this last two hours, I've probably blown it. I can't think of things off the top of my head right now. What was that? Saying, saying out a key, Claire says. <laughs> ask me, ask me, yeah. <laughs> no, she won't tell you. <laughs> no, she loves me. <laughs> but a healthy me equals a healthy we, guys, because it will be the foundation off of which we relate to one another. All right? Is the point of enjoying all these blessings that I've just listed, to go out and live for ourselves? No, absolutely not. And I want us just to quickly take a moment to uh, remind ourselves of Freedom House's mission, vision, and values. Because in my mind, this very much speaks to our identity as a corporate. Uh, It is an expression of us as a community. As uh, Nick just helped me with my words there. Better than what I can fumble them out. Okay, so our mission, and I'm going to be really quick here, is to be God's family living and imparting the freedom of the gospel of the kingdom as it is in heaven. Okay, to be a family living and imparting the freedom of the gospel of the kingdom as it is in heaven. That's the mission that we've defined for ourselves as a community. The vision is, Okay, is to be a resource church. We do this by being a resource church, an Antioch base. If you want to know what that looks like, go and read Acts chapter 13. Discipling and people in their identity, their authority, and the mission that we're on, and the mission that God has for them. So we're only on identity at the moment, and we're taking a long time to really massage this stuff in. But it is absolutely critical for our future. Absolutely critical for our future. Because a healthy you and I means that the way that we interact with the world out there that is throwing a lot of uh, anti-Christ, negative sentiment down, you know, I don't know, what's the word? Um, Just vitriol and venom at the church. We have to come with the words of peace. We have to come with words of love and affirmation and forgiveness and compassion because they don't know what that looks like. And if it is not in you and our friends, then, then what are we doing sitting here? Let's just go and have a lack of suntan on the beach and catch a few waves. For tomorrow, we die, as Paul says. It's just we're, we're, we, we eat and drink and be merry. For tomorrow, we die. What's the point? of sitting here if we're not letting this stuff get in us. Because as a community, we're like a light on a hill that everyone is going to be attracted to. We hope and we pray, but we keep reaching out. It's a both and scenario. So we work on ourselves. And as a result of working on myself, Greg gets to hopefully, I trust, impact you in some way, shape or form for the advancement of the kingdom and draw you in to community, draw you in more towards Jesus, and we engage, and we have fellowship, and we sometimes rub, rub, rub each other the wrong way, and annoy one another, like family, but we learn, and we grow, and we believe the best, and we forgive, because that's our identity. The values, or the priorities, under the mission and the vision, we put God first, Okay, we family, I've said that already. We honor one another. We're authentic. We operate with courageous faith. We're generous. We value multiplication. We go. You know, if I had to, just four things kind of occurred to me when I was 
reading this and praying this and or praying through this uh, the sermon prep over the last month was as a community, the church is called to go, to gather, to take ground, and to glorify God. Amen. To go, to gather, to take ground, and to glorify God. Go, gather, take ground, glorify God. Go, gather, take ground, glorify God. You know, when you, we've got ID books or ID cards. I still actually have an ID book. It's quite embarrassing, actually. I think I'm still holding on to my hair because I had a lot of it in that photo. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's actually a shocker. But, um, but we hold up an ID card and we can see, oh, no, yeah, that's Greg. I mean, I'm going to go to, or a passport. You go through and the guy looks and he scans it and he just checks that, the name he's seeing, the face that he's looking at, or the lady's looking at, lines up with the document that you're giving so that they'll let you into this you know, country that you're wanting to visit. Okay? If we had to take a, a metaphorical snapshot of the face of Freedom House, you know, would they see what we profess in our mission, vision, and values, in our visage, in the visage of Freedom House, if that makes sense? Would they see, oh, you know, we hear about this community on the North Coast that talks a really good game. But do they look like what they say? I just leave that hanging in the air because it, it, is, it is an absolute tragedy if we say one thing and live another. Because then the world just takes one long look at you and goes, well, actually not even that long a look. They literally just scoff and go, pfft. Whatever. Whatever. Talk is cheap, friends. We've got to be living it. And we need to be spurring one another onto good works and godliness. But we do it because of what Jesus has established in us in verse 3 to verse 14 of Ephesians 1. That is the source. He is the source. That is, is, is what we operate from. And so I just want to echo a few words that Alexander shared last, um, last week about how to receive and live this, this sevenfold blessing identity that, that we have in Christ. How do we receive it and live it? And then make a few comments and then I'll, I'll conclude. Are we, all, are we all okay still? Is this going all right? You guys all right? So first point Alexander raised was make a decision to believe. You might not feel like it, friends, but just make the decision. I'm going to choose to believe this. I don't feel holy and blameless, Lord. But your word is the truth over my life. Whatever the facts might say, your word is truth. So I may have had a really bad week, Lord, but thank you that in Jesus, I have been washed clean. I've been redeemed. I have been forgiven and I am holy and blameless. I choose to believe that. And it starts to work itself into my heart. Taking deep, deep root. Receive and confess it. I was actually foreshadowing that, but receive it and confess it. Just keep doing that. Repeat. Put it on repeat, like your favorite song on the worship album that you're listening to at the moment. Just repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Just keep letting your brain get washed. You see, God's into brainwashing, actually. We no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So just keep doing it. We bless the Fraser's crew as they head out. Love you guys. Go and change the North Coast. He has a really key one that I want to help us with, and I've needed a great deal of help in this regard for myself. Rebuking internal voices and external messages that contradict and challenge our identity in Jesus. You see, those internal voices can sound like uh, our friends when we were growing up. They can sound like family that may have spoken something over us. That can sound like a boss or a colleague that has made us feel that big. 
And so we, we, we take these things on, they, come, they become little hooks, and uh, we just revisit them every now and then. And we just, we, we let those things become like a, a playlist that tells us how worthless we are. But Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 14 has something different to say about you and I. All right, so don't, don't let those internal voices become so loud in your ears that it blocks out everything else. And there is a way to do this, and I'm going to share it in a moment. But also the external messages. You know, Paul says something really, really interesting in, um, in Philippians chapter 4. And this has challenged me a lot because, well, let me just read it and then I'll maybe make a comment. It says, finally, so if, uh, Philippians chapter 4 from verse 8 to verse 9. Finally, brothers and sisters. So this is part of Paul's final exhortation to this church he's writing to. Whatever is true. Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I give my, I I can honestly say I don't practice that all the time. Certainly, just being vulnerable and honest here, sometimes I probably watch or listen to stuff that I shouldn't. So we need to become really, really disciplined with the entertainments that we feed on, for example, or the music that we're listening to, or the books that we're reading, or the conversations that we're entertaining. Guilty. Make no mistake, I promise you. Guilty. Guilty as charged, Lord. So out of, this, out of this wonderful promise that I've been given in Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 14, I don't now, I don't now walk to attain it. I'm now understanding, actually, this is who I am. Therefore, I don't want to give myself to those things that would speak the negative, that would, that would whisper in your ear, this is who you are, this is what you are, this is how you need to behave, Greg. This is the kind of body you got to have to be acceptable to those around you. This is the kind of voice you need to have to sing. This is the way you need to preach in order for everyone to love you. Just being honest, that thing is so real for us. But the truth is, is that you are accepted in the beloved the last point here was celebrate and embrace, that Alexander Ray, celebrate and embrace your belovedness. Before you do anything, did anything, God loved you. God sent Jesus to make the way for you to walk in all that he wants you to be. We are in Christ. That is our identity. Galatians 2 verse 20, it is no longer I who live. I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God or in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. That is your and my identity. In Christ. Old Greg, gone. New Greg. You've heard me say this before. New Greg. I'm not singing the song. New Greg. Right? Celebrate and embrace your belovedness. It gives you the strength and it anoints you to die to yourself, I believe. And just the last thing I want to say is out of Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. I want to read it, and I want you to pay attention to the past tense here that Paul uses. Okay? So there's a lot of like stuff that he describes here that's not great, but he's saying, he's speaking about it in the past tense. And that's really what I'm wanting to drive home. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived, past tense, among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature. We were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. 
Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. I believe the Greek word there is poema. It's like his masterpiece. That is who you, are, you and I are. That is what we are, friends. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We do what we do from our established, rooted son and daughtership in Christ, not in order to attain it. Jesus, it's, it's, it starts and it, begin, it ends and it finishes with him. Sorry, starts and finishes with him. our identity, both individually and corporately. Everything that we do as a church, we are working really hard at keeping keeping Jesus in front of us. Because otherwise, friends, just one degree off and you go 10 years down the line and you're so far from where you were meant to be. We have to be extremely diligent in keeping him ever before us. Keeping our eyes fixed, like, no, no, Lord, thank you. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, this is who I am, but it is all in you and through you and from you. Are you tracking with me? Because then I believe, truly, how could we go wrong? Jesus is building his church. So stay close. Keep close. Commune with him. Receive your healing. Receive it both spiritual, emotional, physical, psychological, you name it. It's yours in Christ. Done. (laughs) Repeat that process that I've been describing. Okay, 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 thank you. Just want to just quickly... Two more things to read. Is that okay? I'll be done in five minutes. Are you guys with me? It's been half an hour so far. We commune. We receive our healing. I just want to say this on healing. The wounds that we receive, friends, are so deeply personal that it takes a deeply personal touch from God to do the work in us to get right or to get healed. A surgeon cannot work on a patient from five meters away. You have got to let him close. You have got to let God close. Receive your healing. Repeat that process. Just keep coming back to him. Keep coming back to him. Practice good spiritual disciplines. Jesus had good spiritual disciplines. You read it in the Gospels, as was his custom. Include him in all things, all the time. Make a note, Colossians 3, verse 22 to 25. I won't read it now, but go and read it for yourself. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, changing Izzy's nappies. Greg, Lord, how can I do this and look like Jesus? Making a, you know, it's a silly joke, but let's be honest. Like in every, the Bible says in everything you do. How do you do your shopping? How do you drive your car? How do you talk to your wife after a long day at work? Include him. Stay the course. This is a lifetime gig. I know I said repeat, but you can repeat for six months, feel like nothing is happening, and then you give up. This is a lifetime gig. So settle it in your heart. Me, um, I don't know what age I'm aiming for. I don't really have a number. Let's just say 85. Okay, I've got 41 years to keep going. Just keep going. Stay the course. Stay the course. And the last one, trust. Trust him. Trust him. Take him at his word. Take him at his word. You'll notice that what I said there, 
adds up to, or is an acronym for Christ, or the, the word Christ becomes acronym for that. I'm going to read two paragraphs, and then I'm going to pray for us. Is that okay, Nick? We want revival, right? Amen. Am I the only one? Nick's just said amen. I had another amen on the left there. There we go. Do I hear another amen? Do I hear another amen? Do I hear another? <laughs> we want revival, right? Listen to this. Written by a man. His name was Roy Hessian. He wrote it in the 50s. And it's beautiful. We want to be very simple in this matter of revival. Revival is just the life of the Lord Jesus poured into human hearts. Jesus is always victorious. In heaven, they are praising him all the time for his victory. Whatever may be our experience of failure and barrenness, he is never defeated. His power is boundless. And we, on our part, have only to get into right relationship with him, and we shall see his power being demonstrated in our hearts and lives and service. And victorious life will fill us and overflow through us to others. And that is revival in its essence. If, however, we are to come into this right relationship with him, with him the first thing we must learn is that our wills must be broken to his will. To be broken is the beginning of revival. It is painful, humiliating, but it is the only way. It is being not I, but Christ. And a C is a bent I. Not I, but Christ. And a C is a bent I. The Lord Jesus cannot live in us fully and reveal himself through us until the proud self within us is broken. This simply means that the hard, unyielding self, which justifies itself, wants its own way, stands up for its rights, and seeks its own glory, at last bows its head to God's will, admits it's wrong, gives up its own way to Jesus, surrenders its rights, discards its own glory. Why? That the Lord Jesus might have all, and be all. In other words, it is dying to self and self attitudes. This thing of identity, friends, it's all wrapped up in Christ, but we have to get out of our own way. We have to get out of our own way. You can't do both. You can't surrender to Jesus and hope that he's going to bless you in the way that you want to live your life. You need to bring it all before him. Like what we were singing this morning, we're getting ready. We're getting ready. That means we've got to let go and discard some of the baggage. That means we've got to say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Let your identity be that which is established in me so that I can live out this life bringing glory to your name. Let's pray. Let's pray. Anything you want to add, bro? Is that all right? Tazzy, okay. Father, we are... Let's stand. Can we just stand? I just feel too. Let's stretch our legs and adopt a posture of uh, humility before the Lord. Jesus, we are mindful and acknowledge your presence in this place. It has been so glorious and beautiful from the very moment we opened our mouths to begin singing. We just sense your presence even in the hush now of the, in the room. Lord, I pray that right now and thank you, God, that you are speaking to people about how we can, how we can better massage in the truths that you pour out over us in Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 14. Thank you, Lord, that we are holy and we are blameless and that we are redeemed and that we are forgiven, that we are adopted that we are sons and daughters, Lord of the Most High. What a profound thought that we are chosen, predestined. Thank you, Lord, that you've seen us from before the very beginning of all time from, and just, we're like, they are mine. I want them. I breathe my life into them. Thank you that we've been marked with your spirit, Lord, guaranteeing our inheritance. And Holy Spirit, we want to say, Lord, you are welcome 
welcome, welcome, welcome in this place. As if that needed saying, but I just want to remind us, Lord, that you are present, that you are here to minister, that you are here to speak to us on terms that, rela- that, that make sense to each one of us. But as a corporate community, a family, working hard at following your way, Lord, help us to help us to live out the identity that you have for us. Help us to, to acknowledge what you have done and that from that point, we step into what you are calling us to moving forward. To look more and more like Jesus. To look more and more like Jesus. The, 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 the C is a bent over I. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord. That is our heart's cry. Let, let your identity in ever-increasing measure become our identity, become my identity. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name. Guys, just one more minute of your time for for those of you that can 